Hi, my name is Joanne MacArthur. For almost 20 years, I've been among a small number of photographers documenting the story of animals in our human world. Photographs have the incredible power to shape the way we see things. And perhaps no images have made a greater impact than the photography of war. They told stories that changed the way we think about the history they captured. They were unflinching and unapologetic, and they called us to action. Today, a growing number of photographers are turning their lenses to an invisible war, one that few people see, and that is the war on animals. While on assignment last year, I witnessed something that I couldn't shake. It was a massive night market in Taipei. Beautiful fish and sea life, dead and dying, surrounded me by the hundreds of thousands. The scale of suffering at this one market, in this one city, was inconceivable to me. I went into photographer mode and immersed myself in all that was happening. And then I saw the turtles, writhing as their shells were hacked off their bodies, hearts still visibly pounding as they were thrown into plastic bags. I felt profoundly ill. The brutality, the scale, these are the banal acts of an invisible war. I've always found catharsis in taking action. When I got back to my room, I began laying the groundwork for a project that could wait no longer. I decided that it was time to make my next book. A book about what is and what should never again be. And so, after a year of preparation, I am announcing the book Hidden, Animals in the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene is the proposed name for the current geological epoch. In this era, human activity is the dominant influence on climate, the environment, and all life on Earth. As we enter a new decade, an estimated 80 billion land animals continue to be consumed by humans each year. The majority of these animals are raised inside factory farms. Fish and other marine life are measured not by numbers, but by the ton. Hidden is a historical document, a memorial, and a call to action. The stories within its pages are revelatory and brutal. They are proof of the emergency confronting animals globally and provide valuable insight into the relevance of animal use to human health and to the environment. With the coronavirus pandemic currently wreaking havoc, never has a book like this been more relevant to the future of all animals, human and non-human alike. Hidden features the work of over 30 award-winning photographers who have captured the most poignant and iconic images from animal industries around the world. Joining me in the creation of this book is acclaimed photo editor and journalist Keith Wilson, as well as world-renowned designer David Griffin. Your support will make this epic undertaking a reality. When you purchase a book or one of our perks, you'll be helping us to finish, print, and ship Hidden worldwide. You'll be helping to provide honorariums to all the photographers, which will in turn help keep them in the field, doing the important work that is often unpaid and executed at great personal risk. To meet these needs, we need to raise $65,000. Hidden will be published by We Animals Media. As a result, any money that we make from the book will go right back into funding animal photojournalism and continuing to build our historic We Animals archive. Your investment in this book through the crowdfunding campaign is your stamp of support and solidarity for this vision, and for animals. We're in the midst of a war on animals, and yet, somehow, the individuals trapped within this conflict remain invisible and kept beyond our circle of compassion. We're going to tell this story and make a change. With your support, we can make something historic, call people to action, and create a better world. Hello, everybody here. I can't see your faces. Uh, I, I will assume you're here. <laughs> and um, thank you so much for inviting me today. It's always a pleasure to talk about animal photojournalism. I've made some notes here, so don't mind me while I uh, look down to some of them. So that, that video is a good introduction to my work. Uh, I've been a photojournalist for about 20 years. And I've been to about 60 countries or so now documenting our very painful and complex relationship with animals 
uh, if you're on this call, you probably know what's going on um, with animals and why things are such an emergency and why we need to deal with it as though it's an emergency. Um, animal photojournalism, first of all, I'll, I'll start with that. Uh, it is a new way of thinking about animal photography. Historically, we have wildlife uh, photography, conservation photography, pet portraits, animal portraits, um, but these aren't necessarily animal uh, images that help animals. Sometimes they do, but often the images are for our pleasure. Um, animal photojournalism and conservation photography are things that have really grown in the last decade. And uh, these are in-depth stories, they're newsy, they take time, and they are for the animals, not for us. And, uh, and that kind of work is really important and it's a big responsibility. Uh, I, I wanna always impress that upon people. Um, it's one thing to go and, and take pictures and we have to do that, but to take really good pictures and to practice a lot at, um, at taking good pictures, having your work critiqued, and, um, and taking that feedback and getting your work critiqued can be difficult and, uh, you know, because as photographers, we're very attached to our images. Um, but taking critique and employing those lessons to uh, the work that you're doing to get better. Because, you know, if we keep taking pictures and they're not strong and they're not poignant, people aren't going to look at them. And as we know, it's really an uphill battle to get people to look at this work, isn't it? Um, people just don't want to look because it's painful, it's violent, uh, all the reasons that we know people don't want to look, but also to confront these images is to confront your complicity in the images. So it really is an uphill battle. So we have to do all that we can do to take strong, strong, strong images. Um, I, I do get asked a lot about how to do what I do and how to improve uh, so much so that the team and I at We Animals Media made a masterclass uh, it's eight episodes, and it answers a lot of the questions that people ask me all the time, uh, the how-tos, how to do investigative work, how to cope, uh, how to take stronger images and all this. And so, yeah, I just wanted to let you know about that. Uh, the masterclass is two and a half hours, eight episodes, and it's self-guided. So you just uh, buy it, and you can watch it whenever. Uh, it also has lessons in the masterclass. So at the end of every episode, there are things that you can uh, tune in, uh, you can you know read about and lessons you can go out and, and do in the world. Um, now onto my uh, next point, finding your story. Um, when I started out, I was racing around, just taking photos of everything and putting the images in files or on hard drives. And I, um, that's good, it's a good way to start, good way to practice, but I would encourage everyone to find what you really wanna do and immerse yourself in that, whether it's photographing open refuse or sanctuaries or uh, vegan restaurants or investigative work and plot, plot it out, plan it out. Um, make a strategic plan for yourself and set goals for yourself and um and i'll actually I'll return return back to that at the end of the talk so really immerse yourself so that you can get really strong at this one particular thing that you're doing uh, i used to race around photographing everything that was of interest to me but now what i do is i shoot less and i am much more strategic about it i think about well what do the ngos around me need what is the animal movement focusing on right now? How can I help them at large? Uh, an example is I, I am very passionate about bear bile farming, um, but that is a, like really, you know, that happens in Southeast Asia where I'm not. And there are a small number of animals being used in bear bile farming. And I thought, okay, well, as much as I'm passionate about this, uh, I, my, my skills might be better served photographing uh, chickens, and pigs and fish, and especially chickens and pigs right now, these are animals that the movement is really focusing on, uh, including layer hens, uh, because these animals suffer in, the numbers are just incredibly vast, as you know, and fish, we can't even, we don't even count the number of fish and sea life that we kill every day because it's impossible to count. And so what the team and I at We Animals Media do now is that uh, we run around less doing fewer shoots, uh, we pick stories that are strategic, 
and we create partnerships. Um, excuse me, when the chats come up, they're distracting. I'm like, oh, is someone asking me something? <laughs> um, yeah, and creating partnerships. So for my team and I, the ideal partnership is to have one of us, one of our contributors in the field, to have a partnership with an NGO, so someone who has a good uh, media plan, a good campaign happening, and good outreach. Uh, so that will get our work that much farther. And then the third part of that is hopefully if you can have a media partner. So those three together, you, NGO, and media, that is probably how you're going to get your work out the farthest. And so that takes, that takes time, and that takes time to cultivate, which is funny. Uh, when people think about you know, being a photographer out in the world, they picture themselves taking images all the time, out shooting, but really that's a very, very small part of it. A big part of being a photographer is the hustle, is the communications, is the color correcting and the editing and making your images as good as possible and also building relationships. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, I would say that a minimal amount of my time as a photographer is actually spent taking pictures and a maximum amount of my time is getting those images out to where they need to be seen. Um, yeah, so th yeah, think about, in other words, think about what the community around you needs. You can think globally or you can think locally. Uh, perhaps there are, there's a burgeoning vegan, uh, vegan restaurant and vegetarian restaurant movement in your city. Uh, you can do stories about them, multimedia as well, absolutely, not just photos. Uh, you can write about them and you can support them in that way. Uh, perhaps there are sanctuaries, perhaps there are rescue efforts. Um, I travel globally to do my work, but I always tell people you don't have to travel globally. You can shoot animal stories in your backyard. For example, literally in my backyard, there's an apartment building and it's full of people who have birds in cages. And I can, when they have their windows open in the summer, I can hear all those birds inside, those exotic birds. And I've always wanted to just go back there and do a story on those animals and those people and ask them, why do you have birds in cages? And let's talk about this and let's explore this and do photos that will really, take photos that will really move people and show you know, maybe a little bit about the experience of a bird in a cage. So, so think about that. Um, I thought that there would be a timer on this, but I'm not seeing it. So I have to have to look at my clock. Okay, or maybe someone. You have about uh, 20 minutes uh, for the, your talk. 20 minutes remaining. 20 minutes remaining? Yeah. No, 12. Sorry. Translation error. 12. 12 minutes remaining. Perfect. Thank you. Um, something else to think about is that you are not your audience. Uh, quite often, the work that we do is insular. We don't mean for it to be, but the people who are looking at our work online are vegans and animal rights activists. And we will, you know, if we put our work out that way, we'll, we'll get kudos and appreciation, but how to get your work out farther. And that means thinking about who, do your, who your audience is and how does your family react to your veganism and your animal rights work and, um, and your friends and your community. And so put yourself in their shoes and how can you reach them and how can you speak with them? I always remember that I was a meat eater for half my life I know what it's like to be that person and to enjoy meat and to be very hesitant and uh, defensive. I was those things as well. So I always, always stay, uh, uh, I, I try not to be righteous <laughs> and uh, to talk to people and, and uh, to encourage people where they're at. I remember when my mom told me that she had given up eating pigs. And at the time, my reaction was, oh, well, that's good, but like you can do better. You know, I was a little bit dismissive, dismissive of that. But now when people tell me anything that they have done to create a better a change for animals, I encourage them. I'm their biggest cheerleader. And then people feel empowered by that. And uh, so that's definitely something that uh, I do. So with your images as well, uh, what do you want to say with them? Uh, what do you want to say to people who are outside the bubble of, of veganism and animal rights. I think that's very, very important to think of every single day when we are uh, cultivating what we put out into the world. Um, so down to some, 
questions that, um, oh, well, <laughs> my, ne my next point here is investigations and bearing witness, but I've already talked about that a little bit because I ramble, I go on. Um, but yeah, people always want to know how I do investigative work. And as I've said, you don't need to trespass and do the undercover night work. There are, as I said, there are all sorts of stories that you can tell um, in your neighborhood with regards to veganism and animals. And also, um, there are animals used in entertainment. There are places that you can go where you can just buy a ticket to go in. Um, I remember in the early days when I was doing that, zoos, rodeos, bullfights, I really had a problem with paying the entrance fee because I didn't want to give that industry uh, any of my money. Obviously, I still don't, but I was really turning myself in not um, trying to figure out how I could get into these places for free and create media passes and put a lot of effort into like long letters and asking to get in for free or pretending I'm someone I'm not. But then someone gave me really good advice and that, you know, if you pay $20, 20 euros to, to get into a zoo or an aquarium, that money is not going to make or break that industry. Just pay it because it's a really good investment in animal advocacy, especially if you're taking those images and working really hard to get them out into the world, not just on Instagram once, not just on Facebook once, but constantly building your portfolio, telling those stories, getting them, getting them out farther and farther. So um, that was a really helpful bit of advice for, for me back when, way back when I'm sharing with you now. Uh, investigative work must be done safely. Bearing witness must be done safely. Uh, someone in our community, Regan Russell, yesterday was killed bearing witness. And this is, of course, a huge blow to the animal advocacy world. Worldwide, um, we're all going to feel this. These trucks uh, that are going into slaughterhouses are extremely dangerous. And we feel a little bit immune to, to danger when we're there. Uh, we're keen to give pigs water, take photos inside the trucks. But yesterday, someone got killed doing that. And um, investigative work as well. I mean, the biggest danger when we do that are people, of course, um, sneaking into places at night, trespassing. It's really important to have a team and security and people watching your back and to make good decisions, smart decisions, and to know the legal ramifications of what you're doing. When I travel, wherever I go, I usually have a lawyer's phone number written on my arm here, and I'm prepared. Um, with escape routes and I'm also uh, aware of how much trouble I can get in depending on where I am. It's different from country to country. Here in Ontario, Canada, yes, this week we just passed our first ag gag bill. And so now uh, I could go to jail and get fined huge sums of money if I trespass uh, to do this work. So be aware and be smart. Um, Joanne? Next. Yeah, if you want. Sorry, we have like uh, six minutes left before the end of session. Would you like to take um, some questions on yeah, once you yeah. finish your sentence? I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, that's okay. Oh, I thought I had 12 more minutes to talk about uh, this animal work. I didn't know it was 12 minutes uh, total. q and A's. let's go right to Q&A. Um, I'd love to tell you about the, uh, if you have questions about coping or the new book. Uh, sorry, I talked so long. Uh, no, you didn't talk so long. I'm sorry. Uh, there is one question who is curious about uh, how you feel uh, seeing all those uh, drastic uh, traumatic photos and all the situation of those animals. Mm -hmm. How do you cope with it? That's what they are asking, actually. Yeah, that's a great question. And that's right what I was getting to. Um, coping is something you have to learn to do and you have to practice. And some of you may need... Like, whatever your happy place is, uh, whatever that is, do it and focus on it. As activists, we work with such a, such a sense of emergency that we don't take time to self-care. I mean, this is classic for activism across the board, but uh, you can burn out. Animal activism is very hard because you're up against everything, really. It's an uphill battle. So animals need you for the rest of your life. Animals don't need you for six months and two years until you burn out. So be happy, do what makes you happy, learn about self-care. Um, I have this book that I recommend to everyone. It's called Aftershock by Patrice Jones. 
this is for me like the Bible of, of self care. Um, absolutely dig into books. Meditation is really, really helpful for me. I separate myself from what I'm seeing because I have a very short amount of time to do a really, really good job and I deal with the emotions later. Uh, that's how I cope when I'm in the field. Uh, I also want to say something that I've learned recently is, you know, we're very empathic people. That's why we care so much. It's why we do what we do. But empathy can lead to burnout because you're putting yourself in, this, in the, you know, the space and the mindset of these suffering animals. And that can be very detrimental to your mental health. And so there's a difference between empathy and compassion. Uh, empathy can lead to burnout where compassion builds solidarity and gives you a little bit of safe space. So I would definitely encourage you to think more about that and research about that. There's a lot of uh, research on that. So there. Thank you. And there is one more question, actually, you can also see in the chat uh, section. It says, mm -hmm. I'm posting vegan posts and stories in Instagram and my followers are unfollowing me. I'm following me. I'm thinking that I cannot reach many people this way. Uh, do you think he or she is doing something wrong, what do you recommend? Do you have any recommendation about it? Oh, well, uh, think about who your audience is and how you would want to be spoken to and how you would want to be encouraged. I don't know what your posts are. Uh, if you're shouting at people, a lot of people don't like that. Uh, you will lose followers. I lose followers too, but I also gain followers uh, because what I'm saying is, is truthful. And uh, I try to say things that are indisputable. I try never to exaggerate. And I have images to speak for themselves so that people can think for themselves. Uh, sometimes if we're telling people how to think too much and how to react and what to do, uh, that can be a turnoff. So that's, I guess, the short answer. And also think creatively about how to get your work out into the world, not just Instagram, but um, how you can collaborate with others to build an audience. Okay, and there is also one more question. Uh, what do you think about the social media activism? Is it more affecting than cubes? I know photojournalism, especially the one that you're doing, is also a part of your activism. Uh, but this is asking about cubes and social media activism. How do you compare to that? Well, I think that animal photojournalism is just one small part of the entire movement. And I think that we can all contribute to one another. So I contribute to the movement in this way. But again, think about what you're good at. Uh, I'm not particularly good at speaking with people all day, but some people are, have a gift for that. Um, so what are you good at? And develop those skills. Uh, you might be good at data. You might be good at cooking. You might be good at behavioral science. So really develop that. Um, as to you know, what is most effective? I think that we are just most effective when we are being compassionate towards others, whether it's cube photography, journalism, art. Um, yeah, just to be uh, engaging and strong. It doesn't mean you have to be soft and, you know, overly friendly in those things. Hold your truth, speak to the truth, um, and be accurate and, uh, and be open. Yeah, it's a two-way thing. It shouldn't just be us talking to people. It should always be a conversation. That's perfect, actually. And uh, we have just one more minute. Uh, do you have one last word to say, uh, one last message to give to our audience? Yeah, to the people who are uh, in photography and photojournalism and developing your skills, you can always reach out to us. We're going to be having uh, portfolio reviews uh, coming soon and fellowships for people doing photography so that we can support you on projects. Uh, we, love, we love doing that. We love discussing that with people. And we have an archive. The archive has 12,000 images and videos available to anyone helping animals. So you can use that work for your campaigning. And we also are now bringing on more photographers and more work. So if you have a strong body of work that you want to have on our archive, that we can get out into the world and help get your work out farther, please uh, drop me a message. My email is info at weanimals.org. And we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for spending, sparing time for us. We will share your information. We have already done. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. For Thank you, everyone. Take good care of yourselves. Bye.